it doesn't matter if a, a, a hundred million people like you, they'll all forget about you unless you do something that will move generation after generation. It's hard to make art that it endures. It's hard to make something that stands the test of time. You know, uh, it makes me think of Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man. How do you impart the wisdom of a book like that about talking about what it means to be an artist to the next generation of people? Well, I, I think that no one can really tell another person how to negotiate their path. Being an artist, a poet, a musician, like many other things, whether it's a baker or a gardener, is a calling. You know, I've never had been like a technical prodigy or had any um, testable specialness about me when I was young. I just knew from the time I was seven years old, I wanted to be a writer. That's what I wanted to do. I've wanted to write my whole life. I've written my whole life. Not always good things, maybe very amateur. I'm not very good at grammar. I'm not a scholar. But this has been a desire and a consuming desire since I was a child. And my path went through many of the arts, whether it was performing or singing or writing poetry or taking photographs. It's, it's the only thing that called to me. So I would think it would begin with a calling. People say, you know, why do we write? We write because we can't not write. Why does one sing for the people? Why does one do what they do? Because they can't live without it. And um, if you have that calling, you have to be ready, of course, for extreme sacrifice. Sacrifice sometimes of your family, your time, your loved ones, fun. People that spend their whole life practicing piano, a ballet dancer, an athlete, the amount of labor. Because the arts, people think, oh, it's easy to be an artist. Art is as physically intensive as any of the disciplines. And it's lifelong. You don't uh, just write till you're mm, 30, and usually, and then your, your body's betraying you and you have to retire into something else. You do this your whole life. You're drawn your whole life. So I guess the, this is the long version of the simple answer is, if you're called and you want to come, be ready to work and to sacrifice. So have you always had an ability to recognize great art? Is it, is it um, you know, when you see it, you know, and is it the beginning thing of just an emotional reaction that you feel to seeing something? Well, I've responded to art since I was very young. I, as a little girl, I loved books. I loved books before I could read them. I responded to photography very early through looking at fashion magazines in the 50s and responding to an Irving pen over a Sears catalog. I don't know why, but I did. I, I didn't go to a museum till I was 12. And when I saw Picasso's in person for the first time, when I saw John Singer Sargent for the first time, I was so moved that I wanted to pursue that. I don't know why, it's just, I think everything is intrinsically linked. You know, uh, wanting to commit art and having a love of art, you know, they're, they're wedded. So um, what was it that really inspired you at a young age? I think um, fairy tales, which I read at a very young age and voraciously. And I had, a, I have to say, I've always had a very good imagination, sometimes too good of imagination which often got me in trouble as a child. But I loved to tell stories. I loved to tell my siblings stories. But I remember specifically reading The Selfish Giant by Oscar Wilde. And it was presented to me as a fairy tale in school, but it was on a other level. I didn't understand. I didn't know who Oscar Wilde was. But what I did understand or what I intuited was this was another level of writing. It was really at that moment that I wanted to do that, not just write, but I, I perceived there was another level. Not saying that fairy tales, I mean, Hans Christian Andersen and Grimm, they wrote great fairy tales, but this was another level that, you know, the, the symbolism within it and, you know, well, it's Oscar Wilde, who's, uh, it was a piece of literature 
not only a fairy tale. And I didn't know what all of that meant. I just knew there was something higher to pursue. I was, uh, I was listening to one of my dad's early songs where he mentions Rambeau and Verlaine. And uh, I was thinking he wrote this when he was in his early 20s, you know, and I asked him, where, where did you learn about Rambeau and Verlaine? Because he grew up in a small town in Minnesota. And he said, English class. And uh, it occurred to me that nobody else who was in that class would even remember those guys. And uh, he recognized them immediately. Is there something about being able to recognize art at an early age, you know, to be able to know it when you see it? even when nobody else around you sees it? Did, was that something that was around in, in, uh, when, where you lived in New Jersey at the time? Were you able to find people who led you along the way? Well, there was no real culture to speak of in southern New Jersey in the 50s and early 60s. I mean, there was nothing around. There were no cafes or good libraries, or you didn't see art in person. You had to go to Philadelphia. But what I did have was a very diverse school. I went to an extremely diverse school and learned at an early age about Coltrane and Roland Kirk and so many jazz musicians. But before that, I was also taken with opera. I really loved opera. And I was lucky enough to have a teacher who tried to teach us about opera, Giuseppe Verdi, mostly Italian opera, a Puccini, and a of course, all these kids, you know, who were like, some of them even illiterate, uh, just kids that were either going to go off to Vietnam or uh, girls who were going to be hairdressers, kids struggling, you know, with their families just to make ends meet, really weren't interested in Verdi and Puccini. But I was thrilled to learn about these things. And so we learn things in school, I suppose, that mean something to us. I was fully attentive to learning about Moby Dick or J.D. Salinger, but had very little attention span for geography or mathematics, science, grammar. So I, one whole area of my um, education is very poor, and another whole area is rich, because I responded to that just as one might be the only one in the class that hears the name Verlaine and Rimbaud and takes off on it. You read Melville at a young age, you know, was it something that was visceral to you? Did you, did you uh, feel like it was written deep in the past or was he alive? Were his characters alive? Did you feel like you saw them when you walked around in, a, in your everyday life? And what about J.D. Salinger? You know, he seems like he was a big influence on you. Oh, J.D. Salinger was... You know, I felt like I walked with him. I mean, even when I went to New York, when I was only 20, uh, I was so, in, in a certain way, sort of a hick, uh, full of Holden Caulfield in my head, and, you know, sort of this, you know, sort of well-read, hick, judgmental kid coming to New York City. Melville was very easy for me to wed with the Bible. I had a very strong Bible education as a young girl. So I, I saw the link it was like a grand Bible story, Moby Dick. And uh, of course the writing, such exquisite writing. But I, I didn't feel that it was contemporary or anything. It was just he uh, helped expand the possibilities of the imagination. Salinger, on the other hand, helped expand the possibilities of just walking through life in present tense. So when you first left New Jersey and you came to New York, what was it like? What was the city like? You know, what did what did you find here? Was it a hard city? Was it a was it a shock? You know, what did you feel like when you first came to the city? Well, for me, I mean, just to see people on the streets. You know, I mean, I lived in such a rural area. My father didn't have a car. We walked everywhere. There was curfews. It wasn't a very open situation. And to be in New York City where people were on the streets, young people. I remember like one of the first, the first or probably the second night, I sat all night on a stoop on St. Mark's Place because I had nowhere to go. All night long, falling asleep, sitting there. And there were kids out all night long. And there was music on the streets and it was lit up. And uh, I was hearing White Rabbit and all kinds of music of, of that time, you know, and hearing Tim Buckley or any of the music that people had on 
their transistor radios or something, sometimes three and four songs at the same time. And uh, there was probably a lot of pot smoke and things like that, but I had never even really seen a lot of, you know, I, did, I wasn't really familiar with the drug culture, but I thought it was, you know, just amazing. Nobody bothered me, no cop came up to me and told me it was curfew time. There were interracial couples, nobody seemed to care. You know, it was, uh, it was a young kid's paradise in a certain way. I mean, my only problem is I didn't have any money, I was hungry. So out of the millions of people in New York, you managed to run into Robert Maplethorpe. You know, how did that happen? Yes, three times three times, so I guess the third time was the charm because the third time we met serendipitously, all three times serendipitously, we just wound up talking all night and then we didn't part. You know, it's kind of funny, Patty, you ended up, you know, leaving New Jersey and going right to the center of culture, meeting all these people and, you know, the exact right people to help you develop as an artist. You know, you know, did you realize it at the time? Well, t- to me, I was such a 19th century person. If I could have met Arthur Rimbaud in the street, I would have been thrilled. I met a lot of really famous people that, you know, I recognized they were famous and I recognized, oh, that person sings a song that I really love. But I wasn't looking for them to give me anything. I wasn't a networker. I wasn't after anything. I was too egocentric in a way. I was just really concerned about my own work and my own development. Except if I met somebody extraordinary like William Burroughs or something and befriended him. Robert was a boy. He wasn't, he was just a boy struggling to get through school. He was a gifted artist, but, you know, people sometimes say, oh, you knew all these famous people. They weren't necessarily famous when I was young. And also fame was different, you know, because of our culture. We all dress the same. We all look sort of the same. It was a more open culture. When I was, uh, stay, live, I was living at the Chelsea and Janis Joplin came to stay there a few weeks, well, she, it was my house. I lived there, but she was staying there. And the only difference between us is, yes, yeah, she was Janis Joplin, but she had bigger rooms. You know, everybody sort of integrated. Every, people talked to each other. People weren't asking for autographs, taking their picture. The celebrity culture didn't really exist then. Do you think that the fact that you had Robert and, you know, he had you, you pushed each other's work. You know, do you think that made you each better as artists over time? I think what Robert gave me was a lot of self-confidence. And what I gave Robert was companionship. I believed in him. Um, I supported him financially. But Robert, he was already fully formed. All Robert need, I don't think I made Robert a better artist or helped him be a better artist. I think that I provided an intellectual companionship that he felt was completely on par with his own. And I supported him financially. And we loved each other. He did transform, help transform my work. But, you know, we weren't on a meter. You know, no one was uh, thinking who gives the other more. The greatest gift Robert gave me was to keep me focused and confident that I had worth. I didn't come to, I came with desire to New York City, but not necessarily completely believing that I was good enough. He knew he was good enough. So he wanted to instill that belief in me. And he did, and it never went away. Once I crossed that line, I, you know, didn't lose it. What, what did you learn from Sam Shepard? Did you know Sam Shepard was a special person when you met him? And what did you learn from him? All the bravado. I, you know, found that I had the idea of kicking through doors. I didn't even know that I was capable of the things that I wound up doing. You know, I I had no idea that I could front a rock and roll band or that I would have so much hubris, which I wound up having quite a bit of. But Sam really, just as Robert helped to instill my confidence as an artist, Sam, just as a human being, I mean, Sam was like, I had never met anybody like him. He had more guts. He wasn't afraid of anything. And he taught me, I can say, to improvise. That was probably artistically the greatest gift he gave me because we wrote a play together, Cowboy Mouth, the title, of course, taken from your father. 
which I did that. But uh, we were writing side by side. I'd say, I'd say, Sam, I, he'd say, let's write a play. And I, I never, I don't know how to write a play. Yeah, it's no problem. You think of your character, I have a character. I'll talk to you, you talk to me back. And we wrote this play. Within the play, there was a section, then we wound up performing the play. There was a section that called for each of them to improvise, improvise and argue sort of like with oral poetry. And I said, how do you do that? You know, I, I don't know how to do that. And he said, sure you do, just, just say stuff. And I said, well, what if I make a mistake? And he said, you can't make a mistake when you're improvising. There's no rules. He said, it's like if you're a drummer, a jazz drummer, you miss a beat, you just invent another one. So that made sense to me. And we did that and we practiced it and we sparred like that, sparred with language and it unlocked something. You know, you have these moments of your life where it's like the Red Sea parts, you know, and you see everything. And to this day, it's still something that I employ. In fact, I don't know if this is going off the track, but when I was, uh, I don't know what year it was, 74 or something, was the first time I met your father. And that was one of the things that he noted in our performance was my ability to improvise, but also how my band just went right along with me. And I could trace that right to Sam. Gregory Corso, Allen Ginsberg, you know, very special people that you just happened to run into. Um, what was it like being around them at that time? I remember writing in Just Kids that the Chelsea Hotel became my new university. And truthfully, I hadn't really read Allen Ginsberg and Gregory Corso or any of the beat poets. I was steeped in French poetry as a young girl. I'd read Walt Whitman and, and the classic romantic poets. And then I went right to Bob Dylan. I sort of missed the beat poets. It was probably because of my age and because I just leapt right over them. And I remember Bobby Newworth. I met Bobby Newworth at the Chelsea and he said something about Allen Ginsberg. And he said, well, you know, you wouldn't be writing any of this if it wasn't for Allen Ginsberg. And I was like so arrogant. I said, you know, I, I never read Allen Ginsberg. I'm exactly myself without him. But then I met Allen Ginsberg. I didn't pursue him. He actually, uh, you know, well, I wrote about it. He hit on me because he thought I was a boy. And then we met a few other times. It's the same kind of thing. You would just run into these people. He was always coming into the Chelsea to give money to Harry Smith because Harry Smith was always broke. And I became friends with Harry Smith and wound up getting to be friendly with Alan. And he always thought it was funny because he did try to pick me up on our first meeting. And then eventually I started doing poetry readings with him and William and Gregory. And they all taught me something wonderful and they were all different. Alan, of course, a political activist, a humanist, and I came to appreciate him so greatly and appreciate what Bobby was trying to tell me. And he was so open. If he accepted you in his fold, he offered you whatever he could. And I met Carl Solomon, I met Terry Southern, I met all of these people, and I was treated very nicely by them. But Alan, he had the energy of like a hundred people. He could both spend hours and hours writing poetry, but also respond politically in a, in a very meaningful way in what was happening in our world. William, I just loved as a pure writer. I, I had a huge crush on him and often you know, served him if I could, even just getting him a taxi. But when he would talk to me, what he would talk to me about was the importance of keeping your name clean and not to make any decisions based on fame and fortune because they're fleeting. He said, look, I'd love to have a gold American Express card, but I don't make decisions based on that. So keep your name clean. And Gregory Corso was about as irreverent as you could get in a person. And I had a great relationship with Gregory till his death. You know, he was right in the line with Sam Shepard, bravada, ability, beauty, and bravada. And Gregory, you know, kept my focus on, you know, to maintain blood. Don't be a bloodless poet. Don't be a boring poet, a poet in the school of, you know, keep breaking down doors. 
and it was because of Gregory in a certain way. And my fear of boring Gregory that on my first poetry reading, I brought in an electric guitar and tried to step up because I thought, if I bore Gregory, I'm done. So uh, all of these people, you know, I know my own worth. I know what I, what I do, but I also have no uh, qualms about saluting or almost daily thanking all of the people that helped me evolve. When you first went to the Chelsea Hotel, did you realize so many great artists had spent so much time there that, you know, Arthur C. Clarke and Diane Arbus and so many different people had spent time there over the years? No. I thought, to me, the Chelsea Hotel was all about its past. Robert and I went to the Chelsea because we were desperate. Robert was quite ill. We had no money. And Robert had been told that if you took your art to Stanley Bard, you could trade art for rent. And so, you know, I, we came. I went to Stanley Bard and tried to barter our art, and he wasn't interested. But luckily, I had a bookstore job and got the money to pay our rent. It was just out of desperation, and I had no idea. And when we walked in and Harry Smith was there, I didn't know who Harry Smith was at the time. I didn't know anything about it except its past. I knew that Bob Dylan had written Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands there. I knew that Edie Sedgwick lived there. I knew that Oscar Wilde had stayed there. I knew that Dylan Thomas, you know, had done probably his last works there. So I knew the history, but I had no idea who was there then. I was completely disconnected. I worked in a bookstore and lived in Brooklyn. I didn't know anything about the Chelsea. You know, how special a person was Harry Smith? this seminal collector and, and sort of uh, keeper of the flame of, of so many different kinds of music, you know, what was he like? We don't know much about him now. Harry Smith was one of the most magical people I ever met. You know, he was everything one could imagine. He was brilliant in many, many fields. He was very warm, human, sympathetic. Um, he was also quite a hustler. He was very funny, very paranoid, um, but very loving, and knew everything about everything. And I think um, when we met, Harry was very attracted to Robert. Always when people met us, they, Robert was so, uh, was so pretty, um, they were immediately taken with Robert. But Robert wasn't really much of a talker. He was a doer, he did his work. He was an absorber and a doer, and he wasn't much of a reader. But Harry, even though he was taken with Robert, spent most of his time with me because we had a million things to talk about. He knew everything about alchemy, and I knew as much as I knew. String theory, early filmmaking, he was interested in filmmaking. Bertolt Breck, Mahogany, seminal Indian clothing, magic wands, shaman wands. He had all of these things stuffed in his little apartment, or li couldn't call it apartment, his room at the Chelsea, filing cabinets filled with all kinds of valuable information. The most valuable Ukrainian egg collection in cardboard boxes. He had tapes of Jesse James' girlfriend singing. He had Kiowa peyote ceremonies on tape. And so I would go there, and first it would take him an hour to thread these tapes on his ewer, and sometimes they'd break. But if you were patient, you could hear the most miraculous things. And not that many people were interested. Allen Ginsberg was his number one patron. Allen understood all the beauty and the importance of Harry, and really, I think, pretty much supported him. And the anthology that he did was out of print. And when I realized that he had done, I knew this anthology. You know, it it's, was the Bible of musicians when I was young. I didn't have it myself, but I learned so much about Charlie Patton or whoever one learns about through this anthology. And he had more tapes, more things. And he had such a reputation in certain areas that no one even knew about. I loved him so much, but none of us had much money. And poor me, I was the only person of all these people, that, uh, so many people that we knew who had a steady job. And I only made like $65 a week. And I had to hide sometimes from my own friends because they were all 
trying to hit on me for money, which I would have happily given them if I didn't have to use 55 of it for our rent and, you know, keep $10 to eat on. But that was more of the humorous side of things. So you end up moving out of the Chelsea Hotel, and do you realize what you're leaving? Does it feel like a moment has ended in time, you know? Oh, I was heartbroken. We only moved four doors down. Oh, and Robert and I never had a bathroom or a sink. We had to wash or go to the bathroom in the hall. Sometimes it was hard to get it. I would go like a week without having a shower because there was only one. Sometimes it was broken. And it was so small that Robert really couldn't do his work in the room. I mean, it was really small. You couldn't get three people in our room. But I loved it there so much. I did. I Once I embraced it, it wasn't just the people. I mean, I have to say, when I think about it now, when you're young, you don't think about this stuff. You sort of take things in stride. At least I did. You know, to walk down into the lobby and there's Jean-Luc Godard and Jean-Paul Belmondo or there's Salvador Dali and Gala or Diane Arbus is going by or every day Arthur C. Clarke is running through the halls and Virgil Thompson is coming out the door. To say nothing of rock bands staying there like the Allman Brothers and various rock bands that were staying there. I didn't understand it was magical when I walked in the door, but it didn't take me long to comprehend. And I loved, loved living in a hotel. I have always my whole life, like right now I could live in a hotel. I love living in hotels. So I was heart heartbroken. Robert wasn't heartbroken because it was only three doors down and we were gonna have space to create work. And we were both doing drawings he wanted to do, installations. So he needed the space. He was an artist. You know, I didn't need the space. I was really deep into poetry at the time. So it didn't impact me that we were living in such a small space. But Robert needed and deserved the space. So you're going to do your first performance at St. Mark's Place, and you want to get a guitar player to play with you. Is that a difficult thing to do, to get organized around what this performance is going to be? Well, again, Robert got me this reading. It was 18 minutes, and I would open Gerard Malanga. And uh, Robert was, <laughs> he was so ambitious for me. You know, I was just so casual. He, he said, this will be all the Warhol people were going to be there to see Gerard. And so guaranteed it was going to be a very exciting audience. Didn't really mean so much to me. I didn't have any aspirations toward the Warhol people. But I was excited to have a, a reading, and I really wanted it to be good. I was living, actually, with Sam Shepard at the Chelsea again. And, you know, and Gregory was schooling me, and, uh, you know, so I had Gregory and Sam, and the first poem I read actually wound up on Gloria in 1975. It was, uh, Jesus died for somebody's sins, but not mine. Melting in a pot of thieves, wild card up my sleeve, thick heart of stone, my sins my own. That was like my first poem. I was so I, I was getting my set list together and everything, but I wanted to do something new. Because I went to a lot of poetry readings with Gregory and I just thought, except for like Alan, who was electrifying, or Jim Carroll, who was beautiful. A lot of it was, you know, tedious. So uh, Sam said to me, well, why don't you get somebody to play guitar um, with you? You're always singing little songs too. Why don't you do something like that? And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, he said, do you know anybody that plays guitar? And I had just met Lenny Kay as a fellow writer, but Lenny had mentioned that he played electric guitar. So I went to the record store that Lenny worked at and I said, hey, you play guitar? And he said, yeah, some, and I said, can you play like a car crash? You know, like interpret a car crash? And he said, yeah, I could do that. Well, you know, a little lamp with a little feedback. And I said, great. And I said, well, come and rehearse with me. So he came to the loft and Sam would be there and the three of us, Sam would just sit there and I'd recite the poem and then Lenny would, you know, try to interpret. There was a car crash at the end. It's called the Ballad of a Bad Boy. And then I noted that it was Bertolt Brecht's birthday that we were going to be doing this reading. So I thought, well, I have to salute Bertolt Brecht. 
So we did Mac the Knife. And I did Mac the Knife with like, I think like a fake, like a, like was like doing it like Nico or a fake German accent. I don't know what I was, you know, trying to do like Lada Lenya or something. It was kind of funny. It was more for fun. And I did a Lead Belly song, I think. Annie had a baby, I think that's Lead Belly. So anyway, I just did it. And then it was so great because Robert was there and, you know, all the Andy Warhol people were there. And I think Lou Reed was there. Everybody was there to see Gerard. And then Lenny was quite, I didn't know, he was quite popular uh, in the rock and roll set. So Lisa Robinson and Lillian Roxon, those people were there to see Lenny. And then, you know, I had Sam, you know, I had my people, I had a couple of people. And then a lot of people came that I didn't even know, like Sandy Perlman, and, and we did really good. So what does Gregory say after the performance? Uh, he, he just, you know, he said I did good. But he always did this... Uh, uh, he'd say, uh, but, but I knew you would all the, I knew you would all the time. And I'd say, how'd you know? Because I know, because I know. Everyone was very nice to me, but almost too nice. So where did you meet John Cale? Is he just walking around? No, no. <laughs> Truthfully, what happened was when we had this job, we, we played at the bitter end, but I was fully formed for what I was going to be at the time. I just didn't, never had a drummer didn't think of it because I was still thinking that I was doing poetry enhanced by three chords, you know, mostly three chord songs. And uh, I don't know whether to call Bob Dylan your father or Bob Dylan. We had this job and uh, I'm on stage and, you know, I was, I was a really flawed hubristic uh, performer, but I had energy, I had an energy. But my energy was eclipsed by another energy that was in this room that night. And this is, it, even though 40 years or more have gone by, it hasn't dim diminished the memory of that night at the bitter end. You could feel the electricity in the air, and I thought, wow, is this for me? You know, like, usually it's pretty great, but the, it was another level. You know, you, you can feel it. You, it's almost like the air was crackling, and I thought, something is happening. Well, what was happening was Bob Dylan was there, and, you know, he had, you know, he was so private, and, you know, no one expected Bob Dylan to be anywhere where you were. Not only was he there, he came backstage to say hello, and uh, one of my most embarrassing things. He came back, and then I realized, oh, that's what it was all about. You know, hopefully I did good, but that's what the energy was. And he came back, and I was like, and I was such an agitated thing at that, you know. And he comes back, and he was so nice, and he says, uh, there, are there any poets back here? And I said, I hate poetry. I don't know why I said that. It was like everything he said, I would say, I, I don't like that. I hate poetry. I don't, I don't know Allen Ginsberg. I was so awful. I don't know why I did that because I was, I loved him since I was 14, 15 years old, dreamed about him, pretended he was my boyfriend, listened to his stuff over and over again. And then I see him and tell him and act like, you know, I don't even like you. You know, it was just like, but thankfully, he had a really good sense of humor. I think he just thought I was funny. And people wanted to take our picture, and I was mortified because I thought, he's going to hate this. I don't want to explode. You know, I was so sensitive, and it, one part of my psyche was so sensitive in how he would think. But he was so nice. You know, he put his arm around me, and I was, like, acting so, trying to act so stoic. And then afterwards, I thought, oh, my God. He is, he'll hate me. I walk the streets for the next week feeling like such a shithead. And that wasn't the first time you'd seen him because you'd seen him perform. Oh, I had seen him perform when I was 16. I, I, I babysat for 100 hours to go to White Plains to see him. I saw him in some very pivotal concerts. I saw him with Joan Baez in 1963 or something. I, you know, it's, we go a long way back. You know, that... That performance at White Plains, he was booed. Yeah, I was there. I was crying. I stood up. And it was all these people with Alan, uh, copies of Hal in their pocket. Everybody had Hal. Everybody came in, and they thought they were so cool. And then when he comes out, I think he had a plaid jumpsuit on. He had a hair like a lion, I think, 
uh, in any event, he came out with a rock and roll band. It was so awesome. And the first, he did the, he said something like, this song is called Obviously Not a Freeze Out. But, and it was Visions of Johanna. I thought I would die. And these people are booing. And I was like, stop it. But everybody, it was really really awful. And I was standing up saying, I'm not booing. I'm not booing. Of course, you know, I think he's going to see me or they're going to see me. I didn't want to be associated with these people. And uh, it was it was rough. But it taught me something really early because I got booed a lot when I started. I mean, I would be at bars be uh, and guys would be going, go back to the kitchen. Really stupid stuff like that. Go back to the kitchen where you belong. And, you know, I just like threw it right back at them because I remembered that and I also like had like a Johnny Carson consciousness, you know, to just throw a one-liner right back at them. I wasn't going to be trampled by people in the audience who didn't understand. Sweden, you were nice enough to go to perform for my dad when he won the Nobel Prize and you've seen him many times since then. I sang with him. I sang with him. Our noses were so close, and we were sweating, and I, like our little sweat, you know. It's so, so many girl moments, you know. I have so many, I can look at all different ways that I responded to him through my life. That was actually, after my husband died, um, uh, I hadn't performed for like 16 years, and I think Allen Ginsberg must have talked to him because Allen was trying to draw me out into the world again, and I didn't want to come out. I was devastated. I had no money. I had two small children. I didn't really know what to do. And so when I was asked to go on this East Coast tour, it wasn't a difficult tour. It was East Coast. I was so nervous because I hadn't been on stage for so long. But, I mean, I was ready, re rehearsed. But the thing that made me say yes, first of all, because of, of it was Bob Dylan, but... My husband loved him so much. My husband quoted him all the time. My husband's favorite was uh, Lost in the Rain, and it's Easter time, too. He sang that. When people would get in his way, he would say, don't stand in the doorways, don't block up the halls. And my husband was not a fan of people. He was really his own man, but that was one man he loved, so I thought he would like that. And then, after a couple of nights, we had a clandestine meeting, <laughs> you know, like down in a basement or something. And then I was offered that I could choose. I was given a songbook and, said, and offered that I could choose any song in the songbook and we could sing it together. So, of course, I didn't sleep all night going through the whole songbook. And I thought, I'm going to do Highway 61 because I could really do that. You know, I could really, like, do it like Elvis Presley or something. And then I thought, this is a gentlemanly thing that he has done. Respond in a more ladylike way. So I, d I chose Dark Eyes because of its beauty. I mean, it, the lyrics are Blakeian. The lyrics are so beautiful. And I thought that at this time, I wasn't a, a teenage girl. I wasn't a 20-year-old girl. You know, I think I was like 50 or something. You know, I had gone through a lot of things, and I thought, this is a once-in-a-lifetime situation. Choose a song where you can, you will be not just the artist who you are, but a man and a woman. And so I chose Dark Eyes, and I have no regrets about that. Sorry to go on. You asked me, yeah. but... Uh, <laughs> you know, you went to honor my dad when he won the Nobel Prize. You went to Sweden, and, you know, you picked the song to perform. How did you decide which song you were going to do? In September before the Nobel Prizes were announced, I had an, a big art exhibit in Stockholm. And I, had, I do a lot of work in Stockholm. And some of the people from the Nobel Committee came to me and asked me if I would consider singing at the ceremony. And I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity. I love the, I love following the Nobel Prize since I was a girl, you know, following Camus and reading about Hermann Hesse and all the great writers and scientists and John Nash, because I really love John Nash. And they said, well, after each laureate, someone sing, uh, there's some music. Sometimes there's a singer, usually there's a piece of music, often the national anthem of their country. Perhaps you could sing a song in relation to the laureate for literature. 
So I thought that would be wonderful. So I was trying to think in my mind who might win, and I thought, well, a lot of people say Murakami might win. So I thought of, he did Wind Up Bird, so I said, well, I'll do the song Wing, which could apply to him or almost anyone. So I agreed with the orchestra, but then when Bob Dylan won, I was thrown in such conflict. First of all, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to do my own song. And then second of all, would it be appropriate for me to sing at all? I, I have to say, it, it, it was painful because I had made a commitment and I didn't want to displease him or do anything that was counter to what his wishes would be, but I didn't know what his wishes would be. And then I just, I thought, well, I made a commitment, so I chose, um, I, I thought about all of his songs, and I chose The Hard Rain's Gonna f Fall because of the poetry within it. It's very Rimbaudian. When I was a young girl, I thought it was really, it was, uh, that's when I first made my connection, other than they looked very much alike, with the Rimbaud connection with him, because I thought there was something very, uh, there's a poem called After the Deluge or something that really reminded me in a certain way of uh, Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. I thought because of our political climate, it would be a perfect song. It's a perfect song that melds human evolution, poetry, you know, the strife of other people, not just politics, but more human suffering. And uh, that was the song I chose. Master and Margarita, is this a special book to you? Oh, <laughs> uh, yes, you know, Master and Margarita, I was doing a big installation, an art installation at the Cartier Foundation, and I was living in Paris for like a month or two months, long time, and I'd run out of books, and I needed to go to an English bookstore. But I was doing something which required an Ethiopian blanket, and a Serbian friend of mine sent me... Um, uh, an Ethiopian blanket because he goes to Ethiopia a lot. So I was so happy it was an old blanket, just what I needed. And wrapped in the folds was a copy of Master and Margarita, and it had a little tag on it that said, read this book, which seemed just like in Alice in Wonderland, drink me, eat me, read this book. So of course I did, and I was completely smitten by this book. On every level, I was smitten by this book. I lived in the world of this book, even as I was doing all my work. I was in the middle of Paris, working on a retrospective art exhibit, completely immersed in the Master Margarita. So immersed that I wound up asking my agent to find me a job in Moscow, any kind of job, so I could go there go to all the places. I was everywhere. I sat on the bench where the Master and Margarita sat. I went to the apartment. There's an installation there. Bolgakov, I saw Bolgakov's typewriter. I went to Bolgakov's grave, and which is a stone's throw from Gogol's grave. It took me on such an adventure. But that didn't even end. I fell in love in the book with Pontius Pilate's dog. Because in the story, Pontius Pilate feels so conflicted about what happened to Jesus that when he, he's sitting on the edge of heaven with his dog, Banga, and he keeps asking if Jesus will talk to him. And they say, uh, maybe next year. 2,000 years go by, and he's sitting there waiting to talk to Jesus. Finally, they say, Pontius Pilate, you're on. So Pontius Pilate goes down the path to meet Jesus, up comes Banga and trails after him. I thought, in literature, ever in literature, and I love dog books, I've read The Dog of Flanders and Old Yeller and every imaginable dog book. Was there ever such a devoted dog? That dog sat for 2,000 years on the edge of heaven with his master and then got right up and went down the path and surely was petted by Jesus. So I thought Banga, the dog deserved a song, and uh, it became uh, the title song of my next record. You know, the lost black coat. <laughs> You're cruel. <laughs> yes, uh, my lost coat. I still mourn that coat. 
It's the kind of person I am, like my cat. I gave my daughter a cat after her father died. She just called it Kitty. It was like almost 18 years old when it died, and it died in her arms. And I, I have to say, I mourned that cat as a human being. I, I can't say, well, it was a lesser mourning. I mourned and still mourn that cat. And I'm not gonna compare my coat with that, but I did mourn, I, I mourned my coat, you know. I wore it in Africa. I slept on floors in it. I, I've been to, you know, the finest opera. I've sat in a, in a box at La Scala in that coat. I can't tell you what that coat and I have been through. It was just like myself. How did you lose the coat? I don't know. It's a mystery. It disappeared. What happened is I wore it all the time. It was unlined. It wasn't a very warm coat. We had a very harsh winter and I got a heavier coat and I was just wearing it for a month or so. And then I went, I wanted my coat for something and it wasn't there. I don't know what happened to it. It slipped through my fingers. I looked everywhere for that coat. I went everywhere where I had been in the place. I called all my friends. I mean, I looked for that coat as one with a lost dog. To this day, I don't know what happened to it. And I think, you know, I set my affection on another coat and it left. And I was rereading Journey to the East and the narrator thinks that he was always true to the League and he had his League ring and he feels that other people betrayed the League, but he was always the one who loved the League even though he was separated from the League. And then one day he's looking at his hand and the most important thing they have is their ring. And he realizes the ring is gone and he can't remember when it wasn't there. Like, was it a day, an hour, a month? He can't remember. And I thought, you know, there was, there's some lesson, you know, those are the kinds of things I'm stu superstitious about. I got too materialistic. I would trade, you know, half of the things that I own or whatever I could spare just to have my, my old coat back. You know, visiting graves of authors, you know, and taking Polaroids to memorialize your visit, you know, how did this come about? How did you start to think about stuff like this? Well, when I was younger, um, I, vi I didn't have a camera, so I just visited people's graves um, just because I went to Walt Whitman's grave when I was very young. It's in Camden and just went to pay respects, thank him for his work, thank him for thinking of us because Walt Whitman wrote, a young poet, 250 years from now, I am thinking of you. And so I felt that he threw out a line, you know, and uh, we, we knew that Whitman had our back. So I went, but in 73, I had a little minox and I went to on a pilgrimage to see Rimbaud's grave. I took a photograph of it, not for any reason, except a souvenir for myself. I didn't know if I'd ever get the chance to come back. And on the way, I stopped at Jim Morrison's grave in Paris, but it didn't have a headstone yet. But it was strewn with all kinds of flowers and uh, messages from mostly French children writing his lyrics in chalk in French all over the tombstones all around. And I took a little picture of that just for my own self. And uh, when my husband died in the end of 94, I found that I really couldn't do anything I had two children to take care of. I was just physically and emotionally depleted. And I was used to writing every day, being mentally active, um, maybe doing a little drawings, but mostly writing, and I couldn't write a single line. I couldn't write for several months, but I had the need to do something, you know, to express myself. And one day I was looking and my husband's Polaroid camera was sitting there, the same kind Robert Maplethorpe used to use with film in it. And I owned a pair of Noriev's practice slippers. So I, I just made a little with mosquito net and his slippers made a little still life. And I took a picture and I really liked it. And I felt, okay, I did that today. And I put it aside. So I started doing that, just taking a picture a day of whatever, but it was those slippers that really resonated for me. And then I did another one that was, I, I set up another thing that was like a homage to Brancusi and did that. And I found what made me happiest 
was if it related to someone. Maybe it was because of my early widowhood. I don't know exactly why, and I was alone a lot while my children were at school. And then when I went back on the road, um, I only went back on the road intermittently, uh, according to my children's schedule. And I didn't have any vices, you know, I, I really don't drink, I don't smoke, I wasn't partying. I was really just trying to make a living for my children and find out who I was without my husband. So I had my camera. And I found when we started going to Europe, you know, I wasn't really interested in socializing, but, you know, always interested in the culture of an area. And so I would often visit the graveyards. I went to Prague and I went to Kafka's grave and I, I would start to visit the people that I loved and, you know, continue on that process, sort of a little pilgrimage, nothing dramatic about it. I would just go and, and feel some, you know, connection. And I just started taking pictures, not for any reason, just to do it, but I like them. And I've just, it's something that I've continued to do. I've done so many pictures and uh, in some very obscure places that uh, I, I started showing them publicly because most people don't get the opportunity to travel as much as I've traveled and travel. And most people won't go to the obscure places I go to. And, um, and when you're in a rock and roll band, you might go to 30 cities in 40 days. And so that's 30 different places. And most people don't travel like that. And I have photographs of Dag Hammarskjöld's grave, of Jean Genet's grave, of Sylvia Plath's grave, Herman Hesse's grave, um, Jean Seberg's grave, so many different people. And I always, um, I, I, I always really deeply think about their work, you know, when I'm there. And, uh, you know, so I try to give them my consciousness. I know they're not there. I don't have any superstitions about that. It's just a proximity. It's just my, you know, it's like, it's my own kind of pilgrimage. Are the people of the past still with us? Is Robert still with us? I'm the kind of person that had no problem walking with people I don't know. You know, if I could walk with Rimbaud, if I could walk with people out in my culture that I don't know, but I felt that I could walk with, you know, if I can walk with Whitman, I can certainly uh, access and walk with people that, uh, you know, my, my brother, Robert, my best friend, my husband, my mother and father, you know, my, my dog that I had when I was 11. My dog that I have with 11, I still have that dog in my consciousness. There's no steps. People say, well, why don't, why don't you go to grief counseling and they'll put you through the steps of mourning. I don't, that might be good for some people, but for myself, there are no steps. It's always like the two steps back and one step forward. It's fluctuant. Some days I'll go a few days or I might go a month or two months and I'm fine with everything. And one day I can't bear that this person isn't here. It's just as painful as it was the very first day. And I just think of it, how do you deal with that? You think of yourself as a captain on a ship. You know, you have your ship and you have the sea and sometimes it's smooth sailing. Okay, you're just going through that. Sometimes it's the doldrums and sometimes it's a wild sea and you have to negotiate that. You're still the captain, it's still the same sea and you're gonna get through that and then it's gonna be smooth again. It's a whole package. Obviously, death is part of that package. You know when I really accepted, I'm sorry to go back again to your father, but I remember he did this famous interview with, with a Times guy or something. It's, it's uh, probably in Don't Look Back. And he goes, you know, someday we're all going to die. You know, someday we're all going to be dead. He, he's given this rap about death. And I remember seeing that and thinking, it, it like really hit me. Yeah, we are, you know. So how do you deal with that? I, that, that little, just that little phrase that he, I hear it in my head a lot his voice a lot. It's like something that's a truth. It's, it's not 
profound or anything, but it's a true thing. So we have to, as young as we can or as soon as we can, accept that as, the, as part of the whole package. Being alive is awesome. Even with all the terrible things and all the terrible seas we have to negotiate and all the things that happen in the world, being alive and having the opportunity to express yourself, to know, know people, to, to, to see the sea, to all the things that we love here, birds sing. We have to accept, you know, the slings and arrows of misfortune. We have to accept that we're going to lose people and how, you know, it's up to us how we deal with that. And I've just chose to deal with it that, you know, I believed in my people while they were alive. Do I not believe in them because they're gone? My mother was with me the whole time I was alive. Is she not with me now? I'm not cutting her off. How did you know it was time to write Robert's story and your story? In my head, I'm a fiction writer. That's what I always writ. Most of it unpublished. I spent the whole 80s writing stories, novels, things, always fiction. And then the day before Robert died, I asked him. We knew he was dying, and I was on the phone with him, and I said, what can I do for you? Because that was part of what Robert and I did. We collaborated. I often wrote about him. I wrote many poems for him, wrote catalog copy, did whatever. And I said, what can I do? And so he gave me tasks. Will you write the introduction to my flower book? Very small task. And then he said, and will you write our story? And I said, do you want me to? And he said, yes, only you can do it. Well, I knew what he meant, you know, because our story goes back to being 20 years old and being completely obscure. And I think also Robert did not want to be remembered simply as a artist who made great breakthroughs, was known for his more pornographic images and died of AIDS. That's not the whole Robert Mapplethorpe story. You know, it's, it's only a small portion of it. And I promised him I would, not knowing at all how I would deliver that promise. I did write a different thing for him, uh, some poetic meditations called The Coral Sea. But getting ready to write a nonfiction was very daunting. I, I started writing outlines, but then other things happened other people died in my life. Then my husband got very sick. Then my husband died, and it, it was it took a long time for me to be able to focus on the story for Robert, a long time. And luckily, I met a person, this woman, Betsy Lerner, who became my great friend, my agent. She got me a book contract, and she helped me construct this book. I mean, I wrote the book, but I had no idea how to structure a work of nonfiction. And the responsibility of this book was so huge because it was a responsibility to the chronology, to the time, to the, any person in the book, and to our relationship, to art. There were so many responsibilities. And also, I had to be very careful to serve every human being that was in the book, even if I didn't like the person, even if the person had been cruel to me, they were still human beings. And whether dead or alive, I it was important for me to serve that person well. So it took me a long time. I went through two publishers. I was dropped from my first publisher because it took me too long. But then I wrote it and I wrote it, of course, for Robert. I tried to write it on two levels. Robert was not a reader, so I tried to write it so that it would be readable, almost like a movie for, for non-readers, but also satisfy the reader, the, the person who liked to read or was on a different level. And so I tried to find a way to serve various people, young people, people of my generation, younger generations, and I was just hoping it would have some cult following. Truthfully, I thought, well, poetry books, if I sell 30,000 poetry books, maybe I could sell 50, 60,000, you know, because it was also a way of making a living. For me, the irony is it's to this day the most successful thing I ever did. You know, I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you the truth. It's, you know, it's like in 44, 45 languages, sold over a million copies which for some people, a big, you know, mystery writer wouldn't be such a big deal. But for me, 
a person like me to sell a million copies of a book, and it won the National Book Award. And being a girl who worked in a bookstore for seven years, selling National Book Award books and knowing exactly what a National Book Award meant, it was, uh, it was just an unbelievable uh, gift. And the irony is it came from Robert. Robert always wanted me to be successful. He always worried because I didn't care about money. He always worried about my so-called career choices, which were always bad, almost always. And he worried that, you know, I because I had taken such good care of him when I was young, and he wanted me to do well. And wouldn't you know that it was Robert who forced me to do this by give, uh, vowing to him I would on his deathbed, so I had to. And or else I would have never read it. It's really opened many, many doors for me. How important was the cover of Horses? You know, how important was it to do it? And how important was it that Robert did it? And what does it mean to you now? Well, once again, you know, when we did it, it was just the, it was the cover of the record. Well, back then, album covers were very important. I was conscious of that. I loved album covers. I mean, it's just to this day, the great album covers are still in in my head, you know, and I, I wanted my album cover to be really cool, you know, and there was no question that Robert would take the picture. I had just no idea what the picture would be. I was the kind of person that would want to do like, you know, what Robert called clutter. Is it the bringing it all back home record where he's holding the Lada Lenya record and all the stuff. I wanted to show all my stuff in the picture and Robert was like, just, yeah, just, I'll take the picture. Just, you know, no clutter. I said, okay, no clutter. I just wanted Robert to take the picture and I never, I didn't question. Sometimes we would spar about something, but in the end I deferred to him. I said, I know what I want to wear and everything. And Robert hadn't done like a picture, uh, any work, even though his reputation was growing, but he hadn't done anything that had been worldwide. But we didn't talk on those terms. Like it, it was all about the work, you know, it was like, what would it look like? And, and he, he scolded me and said, don't wear a dirty white shirt. I was always a little messy. He said, I don't want any olive oil stains or anchovy pieces on your white shirt or, you know, pizza stains. And so just get a new white shirt. So I did, I went to some thrift store and got a bunch of white shirts and uh, I liked one, but it had French cuffs. So I just cut them off and just my jacket, just like I dress, uh, same old thing. You know, I had my, I wanted to look Baudelarian. I said, okay, I want it to, it'll be black and white. And I, I had it in my mind. I wanted it like a Nadar picture of like Baudelaire or Nerval or somebody. When we were taking the picture, I had a jacket on. And so Robert said, can you take the jacket off? Because I like the whiteness of your shirt. I was sort of annoyed because I really thought I looked cool in my jacket. And I thought, well, well, okay. So I took my jacket off and just sort of almost like, just a little bit of my snottiness or just being myself. I threw it over my shoulder, just like Frank Sinatra does at uh, The Joker is Wild. So I was like part Baudelaire, part Frank Sinatra. Robert took the picture and he said, I got it. And I said, you got it. It was like only like the eighth picture. He said, I, I, I got it. I said, how do you know? And he said, because I know. He said, it's the one with the magic. I, I, I got it. So he ran out the other four pictures because there's 12 pictures on a Hasselblad. And we went on our way. He picked that picture. He showed me the contact sheet. He had a red square around that picture. And he said, the negative's a little thin. He said, but that's the one with the magic. And I said, okay. And it was the picture. I don't, I mean, Robert loved the picture. You know, Robert always loved our pictures that we did together. And I really liked the picture. The record company didn't like the picture. So the picture was immediately controversial. Little thick eyebrows, my hair was a little messy. They, they, they did a thing where they airbrushed my hair like a bubble. So I was like, they flipped out over that and said, you don't retouch an artist's picture and you don't fix my hair. You know, so it's ni 1975, arguing over your hair. So the, the record came out and the picture made a simultaneous impact with the music. I mean, neither Robert and I expected that. 
We were so used to being in the downtrodden zone. We didn't expect, I mean, the record didn't sell a million copies. It didn't really sell that many, but it got a lot of, you know, acclaim. People liked the record and they loved the cover. And do you know, to this day, I still get letters from young kids, 15, 18 years old, who love the cover. They talk about the cover or they, you know, they, they uh, sort of access the cover for a look or something. And I've met people like, you know, Michael Stipe or different people in my life, you know, that say they saw that cover and they had to have the record. Just like I saw the cover of Blonde on Blonde and had to have the record. So I know when people say that to me, I can't believe it in a way, but it's, I know that feeling, you know, I know what it feels like to see a cover and go, oh my God, I have to have that. Record covers were really important back then. A great book, a great song a great movie, you know, what defines a masterpiece? I have no idea. I'm still waiting to write my masterpiece. It's like, I know the Glass Bead Game's a masterpiece. I know that 266 is a masterpiece. And I know that Moby Dick's a masterpiece and Blue Poles is a masterpiece. You know, when you see a, a masterpiece, Guernica is a masterpiece, but I, I can't say, I mean, I'm, I don't have the language to speak about that stuff. For me, it's just, it's just, I know it, and I don't question it. That's one thing Robert always used to say. He didn't, que if, if he knew something, he always said the answer is there's no questions. I, I remember seeing a Jackson Pollock for the first time in my life and going, yeah, hearing Coltrane for the first time. I didn't have to get to know Coltrane, you know. It's just, I don't know. William Burroughs always talks about the importance of a name. What do you think he means there? Well, I think what William was talking about was the way you're presenting. He could see I was going out into the world. A lot of these people, God bless them, saw more in me than I did myself. Uh, I, when, I, when I think about it now, a lot of people, I've been very lucky with people keeping me from being groomed by the wrong person or giving me advice, like Bobby Newworth, Sandy Perlman, who told me in 1971 I should be fronting a rock and roll band. He wanted me to audition f with Blue Oyster Cult. And I was like, I, I can't, you know, I thought I was an appreciator, you know, more than a doer. And people saw stuff in me and, um, and really encouraged me and helped help guide my path. I can't say that I've been completely exemplary. I've tried to keep my name pretty clean. With a name like Smith, you know, it can meld into a lot of names. In the end, it's about work. That's, that's what is like, I look at our present culture and so much is invested into these things that will eventually fall away. You know, you could have two million likes on a on one of these pages they have, or I don't really, Facebook or whatever, but so much is emotional investment is put in how you are perceived in this sort of shell. And uh, it's not gonna mean anything. It doesn't matter if a, a, a hundred million people like you, they'll all forget about you in a year, a month's time, unless you do something that will endure you know, do something that has some kind of impact that will move generation after generation. And I often get asked by people, you know, how they can get more famous, how they can get a contract, how, how the, should they get, you know, what's the best agent or press agent? And I just tell them, I can't tell you anything about that. You know, I don't even have any of that stuff. I can only say you have to be willing to labor. You have to be willing to sacrifice, you have to keep your eye on, you know, what is it that motivates you? If you want to be like a giant pop star or something, that's great. I like pop stars. If that's what your motivation is, then go that route. But pop stars have to work really hard too. You know, you'd spend 14 hours, you know, just getting, doing one scene in some dance part in a music video. That's hard work. I don't, I couldn't do that. But if you, you really, want to be an artist, what you're trying to do is add to the canon of all the things that we've been given. You know, from, you know, from Alice in Wonderland to the Bible, you're just adding, adding to the canon and, and giving, as Walt Whitman said, 
to you, poet, 250 years from now? You know, what, what a million people think on, you know, uh, or tweeting or right now, doesn't only matter so much. What really matters is what are you doing for the future? I'm still doing the same thing. I'm still doing the same thing that I did when I was basically a kid. I'm still trying to do, and it sounds even conceited, but I don't care, it's what, to do something great. I'm still plugging, I still feel like if I just can live long enough, I believe I can do it. I keep thinking, okay, if I have 20 good years left, I have time to crack this, this nut, you know, I can, I just, I just want to write one book where I can look at it and think, oh my gosh, put it in between Peter Pan and Pinocchio. It's that good. But um, I'm, I'm trying. Thank you, Patty, for spending so much time with me. I really appreciate it.